I would like to start off by saying two things. First, this contains major, 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 major spoilers. If you haven't made it through the series yet, don't watch this video. This is mainly for people who have seen the series before, who don't want to watch my commentary videos or re-watching my commentary videos and have, like, know what's going to happen broadly and would want a bit more context for some of the major concepts of the series as they're going through it again. Also, as with my video on the Angels and a lot of the other supplemental episodes, a lot of this is going to be a combination of canon, extra-canonical sources, my own opinion, and things that it's based off of in other sources, like the Talmud and stuff like that. So something I've very seldom seen mentioned is where the term instrumentality comes from. My understanding is instrumentality is something a priest refers to the act of the priest bridging the divine during the Eucharist, that he becomes the instrumentality through which God enters humanity. And the term was coined or, or used in kind of a similar context by an author named Cordwainer Smith, a.k.a. Paul Leinbarger. Barger. Uh, Pine, Paul Leinbogger was a, a very interesting man. He was the godson of Sun Yat-sun. He was a devout high church Anglican. He was also an East Asian scholar, an expert in psychological warfare, and a colonel in the army, as well as writing some of the weirdest science fiction of the 20th century. Anno was apparently a fan of his and named the Instrumentality Project after the Instrumentality of Man. The instrumentality of man is the universe in which I think all of his stories take place in. So the instrumentality of man is a futuristic government. So th tens of thousands of years in the future, humanity has spread across the cosmos. And there's a loose governmental structure that kind of maintains humanity called the instrumentality. So the instrumentality is an oligarchy made up of lords and ladies all of whom possess infinite power. It's kind of similar to the Brotherhood of Darkness because aren't we all equal in the instrumentality of man? So they're able to basically do whatever they want. They're even able to execute one another. However, if they execute someone, they themselves are executed. A group of them, like a tribunal or seven of them, are able to execute any lord of instrumentality with little fear of... Um, any sort of, I'm trying to think of how to describe it, with any fear of retaliation. So their ultimate goal is to provide a guiding hand to humanity to, to, to preserve the status quo, to really prevent humanity from going forward or backward, and to just have a universe of peace. To go about this, they're extremely pragmatic, ruthlessly so, and they, they operate solely on utilitarian principles, the greatest good for the greatest number, which is something that Leinbarger didn't like. He believed in something called natural justice above objective impartial justice. He didn't like impart, he didn't like, he, it's not saying the instrumentality was a bad thing. It was kind of a good thing, but he felt it was lacking in basic human emotions that emotions, situational things, and just human nature had to be taken into account into justice, and that the individual did in fact have some worth. Which, if this is starting to sound similar to Ava, that's, that's for a reason. So Instrumentality of Man is, is kind of similar to Sele. It's kind of this Illuminati organization that guides humanity, and has brought humanity to a place of complete status, uh, completely static society. Kind of what instrumentality achieves when Sele carries it out. Also, eventually you have a... The kind of the conclusion of his series is the rediscovery of man, in which the instrumentality collapses, and humanity is able to move forward once again and continue its evolution. The instrumentality of man had kind of believed that the world... Uh, humanity had come to a dead end, and that further change would lead to its destruction. So, what is the Instrumentality Project in light of Evangelion? Well, there's a couple different versions of it. The, essentially, at its most basic form, it's the Union of Adam and Lilith. The Union of Adam and Lilith will start Third Impact, 
which will result in profound changes for the Earth. Now, there's a couple different versions of how Third Impact can take place. The Angel's version of Third Impact is if they, they reach Lilith and merge with her under their terms. They will gain ultimate power and be able to kill off all humanity and life on Earth and rebuild Earth with angelic-based life. That is, they will kill everything that possesses the fruit of knowledge and build a completely new ecosystem using the fruit of life. This is um, the, the purpose that Sele lies to Kwaru and says that he is being sent to fulfill. If you see the special scene in episode 24, they talk about how Adam is the legitimate, is legitimate and, and Lilith is illegitimate, and they send Kwaru specifically to reach Lilith, although this changes depending on the director's cut or not, with the idea of it's a suicide mission, but they lie to him and tell him that they've decided to side with the angels and that they accept the destruction of humanity in favor of God's messengers. So that's the angelic version of Third Impact. Next, we have Sele's version of Third Impact. Sele believes that humanity has reached a dead end, more or less. They take the view that humanity is too corrupt to exist, that humans possess extreme selfishness, hatred, war, poverty, disease, that humanity has forfeited its right to any kind of salvation on its own terms, uh, that humanity, to, to quote Stalker, humanity is corrupt, it must be controlled. And that's kind of been their ideology. They've been this shadowy Illuminati-like organization controlling the earth for generations trying to keep the status quo, trying to main, um, maintain stability at the expense of humanity's free will. So, as I've said, they're a Gnostic cult. What they their ultimate goal is, is I think how they view it, and this is how the Gnostics viewed it, is, particularly in Manichaeism, is the individual is a piece of the world soul, or the one that's been broken off by the Demiurge, who's the evil creator god, and trapped within a material prison. The body is a material prison, matter is evil, and the ultimate goal of Gnosticism and Manichaeism is to go through life after life after life and eventually escape the cycle of reincarnation and return to the world soul and become part of the Godhead again. Now, there's different versions of this. Some people attribute consciousness to the world soul, some don't. It's it's rather complicated, but ultimately they, they think that is the destiny of humanity and Gnosticism, and that appears to be Sele's ultimate goal. They wish to return humanity to the world soul, and thus with God. Someone once described mysticism at its core being about the union of the individual with God. So when Sele's plan is enacted, all, human, all humans lose their individuality and become part of a supreme being that's all-powerful and all-knowing. All the individual barriers between humanity that created things like war, hatred, intolerance, disease, crime, have gone away along with individuals, and humanity is one. Now, how they achieve this is in line with my view that they're a Gnostic cult, is they carry out a ritual. So they have the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is their sacred text, and they view fulfilling them as fulfilling the ritual that will return them to godhood. That's the kind of thing I think people have to understand about Gnostic cults and mystery religions, is a very strong focus of it is there are bearers of secret enlightenment, bearers of secret knowledge. And a lot of people think secret knowledge means like revelations, like metaphysical stuff, you know, like just kind of higher philosophy, like higher levels of Plato or something. But what mysteries normally means is magical formulas, rituals, passwords, stuff like that, which is supposed to advance you up the chain of being. We have the tree of life here, so it's supposed to advance you up the tree of life until you eventually reach Keter at the top and you cease to exist in the material world. <coughs> so Sele has a much more human-centric view than Gendo does. So ultimately, as they state, we don't intend to use the angels to put forward our agenda, whereas Gendo does. Their plan is entirely dependent upon 
using the mass production AVA series in Unit 1. Now, there are 10 planks on the Tree of Life, and they build nine mass production AVAs. So nine mass production AVAs plus Unit 1 equals a Tree of Life. And as you can see here, they literally form it. So in completing their ritual of combining the Tree of Life of creating the tree of life by combining all of the the various symbols together, they're able to generate an anti-AT field. The anti-AT field, commonly known as tanging people, basically everybody, when third impact happens, has their, their ultimate wish fulfilled, and they become one with the Godhead. So whoever they love most appears to them and takes them into third impact. So in the case of... Makoto, he's in love with Masato, so she takes him in. Maya's a lesbian, so Ritsuko comes from her. Yui comes to Fayuski. Gendo is interesting because he doesn't meet the person he loves most. Unit 1 appears and bites his head off. Now it's debated, does that mean he's excluded from Third Impact? People interpret that as Yui turning on him and betraying him. I don't think so. I think what it is, is it's a, it's a manifestation of his guilt. I think he does get ascended, um, put into the Godhead, especially since he shows up in episode 25 and 26. The issue is, it's his guilt. So his greatest desire is to be punished for what he did to Shinji and what he did to humanity. And that ultimately, to a certain extent, overrides his love for Yui. So it's I don't think it's because he gets... Re kicked out of third impact or even that yui necessarily rejects him but just the fact that he suffers from immense personal guilt so sele's plan really doesn't involve adam or lilith at all they're entirely determined to use the mass production models sele's plan is pretty flexible though as they're willing to to just kind of accept whatever happens. When Gendo's plan also happens, they're happy to just go along with it. It seems to change repeatedly throughout the series, and that could just be plot holes and continuity gaps. But by and large, they don't really care what it takes to achieve their ends. Now, in the video game Evangelion for PlayStation 2, which threw a whole bunch of plot wrenches in, their their plans changed again, changed, to what they wanted was each member wanted to be placed inside of a mass production model, which is immortal. So it's it's a bio, it's a biomechanical organism that can fly and has an S2 engine, which makes it immune to death, basically, and able to live forever, and they would become immortal gods. Whether or not humanity would actually be merged is more ambiguous in that case. There's also kind of a third theory that what Sele wanted was the return of the world soul, but them to serve as aeons or to be the dominant force within the world soul. Uh, you have this in something very similar in Sid Meier's, Sid Meier's Alpha Centauri, in which you make the planet sentient and everyone is able to upload their mind to become part of the planet, but the personality of the planet is made up of a few elites who are able to, to a certain extent, retain individuality and direct the god force that the planet becomes. So that's essentially Sele's plan, is the, the annihilation of the self. So then we come over to what is Gendo's plan. I call it Gendo Yui's plan because I think ultimately they were in sync. Gendo seems to think in 24, at least, that he's fulfilling Yui's wish that they both kind of were ultimately had the same goal. I don't think there's really any evidence they didn't ultimately have the same goal. They might have gone about it slightly differently, but it very likely could have all been part of the plan. Gendo's uh, Yui becoming part of Unit 1, everything else that happens in the series. I don't think there's any real evidence that she's not complicit in with all of it. So what Gendo's plan is, is a lot harder to determine. There's a couple major theories. One of the major theories is that ultimately all he wanted was to be with his wife again. And he was going to basically use Adam to reunite with Unit 1. And him and Yui would live together inside of Unit 1 for all time. And because he took Adam and Lilith with him, humanity would also be safe from any future impacts. 
So that's kind of the first theory. Some modifications of it state that he wanted to take Shinji with them so they could exist as a family together for all time. Another theory is that he wanted to put all of humanity within Unit 1. For Some people believe that the purpose was to keep them in Unit 1 forever. Another theory is that Unit 1 was supposed to be an arc of sorts. The third impact was inevitable, and Gendo wanted to put all of humanity into Unit 1 with the idea of everybody leaving and returning to their forms once, once it's over. Some people also think that it was intended to be permanent and everyone would permanently be stuck in Unit 1, and it was kind of a modified version of Sele's theory. Uh, version. Sally also refers to not wanting to use Ava as a personal arc, which seems to imply that's what Gendo wanted to do. There's also a theory that Yui and Gendo thought Third Impact was a good thing so long as people were ultimately able to return, that the experience of Third Impact would spur the evolution of humanity, because everybody would able, be able to see the hearts and dreams of everybody else they would finally learn compassion and people would be able to understand one another. And it would make you, it would be kind of, some people called it a group therapy session, but all of humanity would finally be able to move past a lot of its deep-seated flaws and live up to its full potential. So some people think it was just supposed to be a temporary thing. Everyone would become one of the Godhead and then re-separate. So whether or not, get, what Gendo's ultimate motivation was, is he does say death creates nothing, and he seems to be at least somewhat opposed to the to Sele's plan, which is for humanity to eternally exist as the Godhead. Unfortunately, we don't really know exactly what everybody's plans are, because they change constantly in line with whatever the scenario of the week is, and it, it is very confusing. As to what Yui's plan was, I think it's safe to assume it's similar to Gendo's plan, whether or not he altered it somewhat to achieve his own goal of being with his dead wife again, I'm not really sure. But what winds up happening with instrumentality is humanity is entirely merged into one, with the exception of Shinji. It seems like, in contrast to either Sele or Gendo's plan, Third Impact is dominated by Adam and Lilith. And Adam and Lilith, rather than destroying the planet and starting over, both in their lifetimes came to greatly respect and love Shinji. And they decide that he is an, a fundamentally good person and one worthy of making the decision as to what the ultimate fate of humanity will be. So, much as with Christ, Shinji drinks in all the sorrows of humanity, all the hatred, all the sin, all the love, all the dreams... He literally gets to be everybody, which is, if we look at what happened with Christ, Christ, when he was on the cross, took in all of humanity's sins, the punishment for everything wrong humanity had done, all the sorrow in the world, all the hatred. And much as with God, Shinji had to make a choice. Was humanity, in spite of all its, its hate, all of its, its evil, worthy of salvation? Was it worthy to continue to exist? Was there inherent meaning in it? Kawaru and Rei both seem to think so, but they left the ultimate choice with Shinji. Would he destroy the world or redeem it? Would humanity end and be replaced with a, a perfect successor that lacked any human characteristics? Or was the perfect successor actually inferior because it lacked all the things that make life interesting and that make life meaningful? Ultimately, I think what Shinji decides is that despite his fear, etc., humanity succeeds to exist. In episode 26, he finally comes to terms with the fact that he's not actually a bad person and people aren't nearly as negative as he believes they are. That in truth, most of his suffering is self-inflicted. I'm not blaming him, but that comes from his own insecurities, his own depression, and that he has many people around him who love him and care for him. And because of that, and because he kind of realizes that everybody has that, he ultimately decides to redeem humanity. Uh, Fiyuski says, I'd rather live in the world, real world, no matter how contaminated by sin it is. And Ray refers to life saying, it's bitter, but it's warm. So ultimately, Shinji makes the choice to end instrumentality, and humanity is allowed to come back. Anyone who wishes can remain part of the Godhead, 
and anyone who rejects it is able to come back as a normal person. So ultimately, I think we can say that Gendo and Yui's instrumentality plan succeeded. However, it was carried out in a different way than what they expected. So that's my attempt to explain instrumentality. I hope that made sense. If anybody has something else they want to add to it, let me know. I might have to redo this once we get closer to the end. But yeah.